Thirty Minutes Over Oregon, a Japanese pilot's World War II story, by Mark Tyler Nobleman and illustrated by Melissa Ewai. Prologue. On December seventh, nineteen forty-one, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, an American naval base in Hawaii. The surprise attack killed thousands of soldiers and brought America into World War II. To retaliate, the U.S. bombed Tokyo from the sky. This became known as the Doolittle Raid, which would later be memorialized in both a book and a film called Thirty Seconds Over Tokyo. In response, Japan set out to prove that continental America, though far from all World War II combat, could also be bombed. This is the story of what happened next. Fifteen miles off the Oregon coast on September ninth, nineteen forty-two, Nobuo Fujita strode across the slippery deck of a submarine. He gripped the four hundred year old samurai sword that had been in his family for generations. Come on, he told his navigator. It will soon be sun up. They climbed into a small plane that was about to be launched by catapult toward the United States. As he did before every flight, Nobuo strapped the sword to his seat for good luck. Crew members loaded one hundred and sixty-eight pound bombs under each wing of the plane. The Japanese hoped the bombs would start a fire that would consume the Oregon woods. Then rage into nearby nearby towns and cities. Do not tell anyone, Nobuo's commander had told him. Not even your wife. So instead of sharing with Ayako what Japan had entrusted him to do, Nobuo left strands of hair and fingernail clippings for her to bury if he didn't make it back. If the American military shot at him, his plane would not be fast enough to evade being hit. The catapult flung the plane off the sub with a hard whoosh. Steering into the rising sun, Nobuo scanned the sky for American fighters, but saw none. When he flew over the tiny town of Brookings, Oregon, some of the residents heard the motor. A few saw the plane puttering through the fog, but almost none suspected it was an enemy aircraft. Shortly after 6 a.m., high above the thickly wooded mountains, nine miles east of Brookings, Nobuo gave his navigator the order: "The bombs are to be dropped here." Nobuo wheeled the plane over his shoulder. He caught sight of a white flash below. He beelined back to the ocean, flying low enough to clip treetops. He landed on the water, and the sub crew hoisted the plane aboard with a crane. They quickly removed the wings and floats and stowed everything in a watertight hangar. The sub then dove 250 feet. Meanwhile, the forest was burning, a bit. Only one of the two bombs had exploded, sparking patches of fire that didn't spread. The ground was too damp from recent rain. The other bomb had buried itself on impact without a trace. Four men from forest lookout station spotted smoke and trudged several hours to the remote site and extinguished the flames. They figured the fire was caused by lightning, but noticed a splintered tree and beneath it a small pit in a circle of scorched earth. Widening the pit into a crater, they uncovered metal fragments. Some had markings in Japanese. The news that a foreign foe had flown in and out of American airspace undetected zipped through Brookings. Townsfolk were shaken, but many were more concerned for their relatives fighting overseas. Several newspapers put forth the notion that the plane may have taken off from a sub, but this was dismissed as improbable. The military assumed that the incident was isolated and did little to increase their efforts to defend the coast. Twenty days after the bombing, Nobuo did it again. Same plan, same plane. Only that time, for greater stealth, he went by night to protect coastal communities from becoming easy targets. The U.S. military routinely ordered blackouts during the war, <clears throat> but the lighthouse at Cape Blanco remained lit and guided to shore by its beam. Nobuo headed to a wooded area north of Brookings and dropped two more bombs on Oregon. On his return, Nobuo could not locate the sub. Nearly out of fuel, he resigned himself to dying with honor by winging back and crashing into the lighthouse. The mission comes first, the sub next, he said to his navigator. We come last. <clears throat> But a moment later, he glimpsed a dark, shaky shimmer on the ocean swells, an oil leak from his sub. The Japanese believed the second two bombs had detonated. Americans scoured the woods but found no fragments and no damage, or if they did, they kept quiet about it. 
Either way, Japan claimed both invasions as victories. They had caught America off guard. After years at war, Nobuo returned to Japan, anxious to rejoin Ayako and their young son and daughter, Yoshi and Yuriko. As the ship pulled into port, into home, Nobuo gazed through binoculars to mask his tears. In 1945, Jap- Japan surrendered to the United States and its allies, ending World War II. Nobuo opened a hardware store and lived quietly in a Tokyo suburb. He never discussed his Oregon raids, though they were rarely out of his mind. And the residents of Brookings largely forgot about their close call until 1962. That year, Brookings, the Brookings JCs, a leadership organization, was looking for a way to boost tourism to their sleepy burg. One member had a bold idea. He suggested they track down the Japanese bomber pilot and invite him to attend their annual Memorial Day festival as a guest of honor. So they did. To their surprise, Nobuo accepted their invitation. And they weren't the only ones who were shocked. This was the first Nobuo's family had heard of what he had done in America. One U.S. newspaper published a petition condemning the idea. Those who signed it felt that any soldier saluted in Brookings should be American. Furthermore, it would be expensive to fly over Nobuo, Ayako, and Yoshi, now 26, who would act as a translator. <clears throat> Despite the pressure to cancel the visit, the JCs didn't give in. Welcoming Nobuo, they announced, would be a symbol of reconciliation, not just between individuals, but also between nations. Another newspaper printed a letter from a veteran who wrote, he was doing a good job, and we were doing a job. Other veterans, including the governor of Oregon and President John F. Kennedy, also praised the invitation. Protesters began to open their minds. Yet, Nobuo was nervous. Initially, he feared Americans were tricking him into coming so they could put him on trial as a war criminal. He worried they would insult him, egg him, beat him. But he knew he had to go, no matter what. It would be impolite to refuse. Again, he brought his family sword. This time, however, it was not for luck. Over the years, Nobuo's war pride had shriveled into guilt. His brother had been lost in battle. His country had suffered catastrophically when the United States dropped atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And though his bombings hadn't hurt anyone, that had been the intention. If the people of Brookings accepted the apology he planned, he would gift the sword to the town. If they did not, he would use the sword to commit seppuku, a traditional Japanese suicide by a person overcome with shame. A large group of people awaited his arrival at the airport. To his relief, they greeted him and his family, not with anger, but with warmth. Gesturing to the jetliner he'd flown in, Nobuo said in good spirit, a little larger than the plane in which I made my first trip. During the festival parade, an official introduced the Fujitas, who bowed three times to the applauding crowd. Nobuo shook the hand of a six-year-old boy who said he wished to visit Japan. At a banquet in Nobuo's honor, Nobuo and Yoshi handed over the sword, which the library would display. I never imagined I could, walk, be, I could be back in Japan alive after my flight over America, Nobuo said softly, and I never dreamed I could visit the United States again. Later, Nobuo met one of the men who had put out the fire. You're one of the worst fire setters in the world, the man said. If you're going to set another fire, do the same good job. A local pilot flew Nobu over the wilderness he had bombed and let him take controls for a short while. Before leaving America, Nobu said that he would like to host Brookings residents in Japan one day. That day came 23 years later. At Nobu's expense, three Brookings high school students traveled to Japan. Accompanying them was a now-grown boy from the 1962 parade. For a week, Nobu toured his guests around his country. Their goodbyes were awash with emotion. The war is finally over for me, he said. Nobuo made three more trips back to Brookings. At a party in 1990, he was served a large submarine sandwich topped with a plane made of sliced pickles and a half-olive helmet. Nobuo did not speak English, but everybody understood his reaction. In 1992, one day ahead of the 50th anniversary of his first bombing, he planted a tree seedling at the bomb site. In 1995, 
A pilot again flew him over the forest and gave him a brief chance to fly the plane himself. Nobuo donated thousands of dollars to the town, specifically so the library could buy children's books that celebrate other cultures. He wondered if World War II would have been different had his generation grown up reading books like those. In 1997, Brookings got word that Nobuo was not well. Urgently, a town representative flew to Tokyo to tell Nobuo in person that Brookings had made him an honorary citizen, precisely 55 years after his second bombing. The next day, at 85, and at peace, Nobuo passed away. The following year, as Nobuo had requested, Yoriko sprinkled some of his ashes over the bomb site. A flutist played a solo combining the national anthems of Japan and America. At the time of his death, Nobuo was the only person who had bombed the U.S. mainland from a plane. He spent much of his life hoping no one would ever take that title from him. <laughs> 